Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, my name is Nancy Bui. Uh, today is uh, September 23, 2013. I am in Orange County. I'm interview uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Annette. Um, good morning, sir. Thank you so much for granting this interview. Can you state your name and your profession? Yeah, Peter Arnett. I was a journalist for most of my life. In the last six and a half years, I've been an academic in China. Sir, uh, you was uh, working in Vietnam during Vietnam War. Uh, can you tell us the, how long you were there and what the type of uh, job you do? Sure, I was hired by the Associated Press in 1961 to be their correspondent in Jakarta, Indonesia. <clears throat> in the following year, I was assigned to cover the then very small uh, Vietnam War in Saigon. So I did indeed go to Saigon on June 26th of 1962 and joined Malcolm Brown, who was the correspondent there and bureau chief, and also Horst Fass, who was a photographer born in Germany who had been working with the Associated Press, and he also arrived the same day. So the three of us uh, were together in, uh, in Saigon in some very critical years. Wonderful. Uh, so in your opinion, uh, what caused and who responsible for the war? Well, we know a lot more about the historical decisions today than we did then. Uh, but from my reading of it and what recent histories say, it is very clear that uh, President Dwight Eisenhower in the early 1950s, as the French colonial effort to reestablish itself in, in Vietnam was failing, that uh, President Eisenhower and his aides decided that South Vietnam's survival was an important part of American national interests. And he began in the early 1950s, you know, preparing for American involvement in Vietnam. And in the course of his uh, presidency, uh, No Dinh Diem was uh, brought to Vietnam, uh, supported by the Americans to become president, and uh, much American military and uh, financial aid was given during the Eisenhower administration. When President Kennedy came into office, he supported the policy. The idea by then it was that the significance of Vietnam was like a domino, a falling domino. The, or one domino falls, the whole line of dominoes fall, and South Vietnam was seen as a domino. If South Vietnam was to go, Laos, Cambodia, maybe Thailand, Indonesia. So President Kennedy continued with that policy, and he ended up sending 20, 30,000 advisors. President Johnson also believed in the domino theory, as expressed often by uh, Dean Rusk, his Secretary of State. And President Johnson sent well over half a million troops to Vietnam. But by late in the 60s, his confidence in the theory and in victory in Vietnam uh, was was eroding, and he decided to uh, step down from office and go ahead with serious negotiations with the North Vietnamese communists. And President Nixon, when he came into office, basically over the course of four or five years, planned the American and implemented the American withdrawal from Vietnam. The final president involved President Ford made critical decisions early in 75 to stop supporting militarily the South Vietnamese, and that was it. Yes. Thank you, sir, uh, for stating the war in a such spirit, uh, I mean, um, short period of time, but very much cover your point of view about the Vietnam War. But um, in your view, I don't see the picture of the Vietnamese yet because um, the Vietnamese are the people who really suffer, uh, you know, by the communism that implanted by Ho Chi Minh. And um, even the, during French War, he already started that in 19, 
we came back from after 30 years of I, I mean living uh, outside the country he came back with the agenda communism and when he start getting a little power by little wherever he go he start implementing the communism that's why the people suffer so much but the, the main thing is in 1959 on his birthday May 19 uh, May 1959 uh, he uh, pulled his troops to Ho Chi Minh Trail and start invaded Vietnam. Vietnam would divide into two parts, north and south. So, uh, make it short. Um, what do you respond to people, Vietnamese people, point of view regarding to they said this uh, Ho Chi Minh War? He started it. He want to invade the south so he can have a total control of the Vietnam. What do you respond to that? Well, my my explanation about you know, how the war started was was still valid. A series of American presidents believed that the survival of an independent South Vietnam was important to American national interests. They went ahead to provide military assistance, political assistance, and, uh, and economic aid in vast quantities. And as the threat from the communist side, North Vietnamese grew, the American effort grew, and as the involvement of uh, the Russians and, and Chinese and giving military and political aid uh, developed, so did America respond uh, with eventually over half a million troops and fought a war, certainly three or four years of very intense military activity. And uh, it was a, in full awareness of what the North Vietnamese were doing. And in, but by 1968, uh, President Johnson determined that he was not prepared to continue the effort. Now, how did that come about? So, you know, I have a, a library of 7,000 books on Vietnam. Yes. There were three or four being published every month. Yes. A history of the Vietnam War this year won the Pulitzer Prize for History. Now this is 2013. But a book on the Vietnam War won the Pulitzer Prize for History. So you can see it is an issue that's hotly debated. And in fact, uh, this coming week, your, uh, your university you're associated with, University of Texas, is having a symposium in Washington, D.C. for several days that that has some of the reigning experts on Vietnam to discuss the issue, the whys, the hows, you know, how, what ifs. This is still being discussed in great detail. Now, but I'm aware, because being in Vietnam from 1962, of the commitment that South Vietnamese people were making to the war, for the first uh, three and a half years that I covered the war for the Associated Press, up to early 65, I covered Vietnamese units. I went out with the 44th Ranger Brigade down in the Mekong Delta. I went out with Vietnamese, Vietnamese Marines around Quang Dai. I went up uh, north of Hue and uh, to the highlands, me and other reporters who were there in those early years. Uh, I got to know many Vietnamese officers and uh, wrote many, many stories about the evolving crisis in Vietnam, as did other reporters at that time. And we did document the growing size of the war, the influence of the communists, the existence of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the effect that, uh, that the clandestine communist entries into, into, into South Vietnam, you know, were, were allowing the communists to continue fighting, to continue reinforcing. We wrote a lot about that because when we went into the countryside, we met American officers, Vietnamese, who talked about it. The argument by 1966-67 was, how do we close the Ho Chi Minh Trail? At one point, historically, we know General Westmoreland suggested 
nuclear weapons. Earlier in the war, 64, Barry Goldwater, the presidential candidate in 64, had mentioned nuclear weapons. There was a lot of frustration uh, on the American military side that the policies at that time were not working, the military policies. Well, there were two levels. The commanders in Vietnam argued that there were political restraints on fighting the war. General Westmoreland would later write about it, that he felt that he needed more freedom to cross borders, to enlarge the war, and yet a Prime Minister Nguyen Cao Ki kept demanding that there be an invasion of the North. So there was a lot of argument about how to move beyond the, the communist success in using the Ho Chi Minh Trail to reinforce it, 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 its uh, position in the South. We knew it. We wrote about it. It was widely debated in American Congress. You know, we all knew that the, what the communists were doing. The issue was, could the American military, could American policy be successful in preventing their eventual takeover of the South? We know that. Couldn't come up with the policy to make that happen. Now, why didn't they come up with that policy? There were several reasons. One was that the one one was that the extent, potential, not the dangers, but the potential intensity of the war was not realized by the early American presidents, Eisenhower, Kennedy. In all their writings, neither of them envisaged a land war in Asia. In fact, President Johnson, running for election in 1964, said, American boys will never be fighting a land war in Asia. America had been in Asia in World War II and Korea. Many had died. And the value of their successes in Asia were limited because spending time defeating Japan and, and uh, winning a victory for Chiang Kai-shek in China disappeared when the communists took over China. And so the American public and American politicians were concerned about getting committed to Asia again and stated it. There is still a debate about whether President Kennedy would have reinforced the American advisory effort with, with ground troops. Still debated. Some say he would have. Some say he would have pulled out of Vietnam. We haven't resolved those issues. Now, President Johnson went ahead and decided to make a major commitment of ground forces and kept explaining to the American public that this was a war worth fighting and that the South Vietnamese were worth fighting for and that it was a valued ally and uh, the people around him, Secretary of Defense McNamara visited Vietnam often, the Secretary of State Dean Russ came, they kept talking about that commitment. But by 1968, that had all changed. Sorry. I could go on and on, but we'll, yes, we'll, like we'll to, break for to, another question. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to ask a question, and I uh, and forgive me if I keep going back. That uh, 7,000 book you refer about and all the things you describe, I see all the big uh, picture, all the you know, big figure, um, politics, politician and everything, but I didn't hear about the Vietnamese people. And during the war, you know, nobody uh, or very little uh, covered the news what, uh, how North Vietnamese live under communism with the leader, Ho Chi Minh leader. Uh, I'm original from the North, even I was born a baby and my mom carried me in a basket going to the South. But my uncle, my grandfather, would stay back because they, 
they own some land and they think that you go to the south, you have nothing, how can you start your life? And at that time, propaganda is uh, talking about people going to the south, they work hard and they die uh, in, in the rubber plantation, so far and so on. So they didn't go, but my father, grandfather was uh, uh, going through you know, what they call land reform and he was stoned to death in his village. And my uncle was in prison for 13 years and so far and so on. So although that happened in the north, and I don't see any western or very little, I, I, or not at all, cover how North Vietnamese lived during the war. And that's why uh, over one million of North Vietnam ran to South when uh, the country divided into half and the North belonged to. That 7,000 books still missing the part. <coughs> why is that war happened? Or with the politicians you describe, I see exactly what that happened. But all those, they forgot about the people. And the people that they, yeah, you know, they said, uh, we do this uh, on the name of the people, of Vietnamese people. And it seemed like none people pay uh, a lot of attention on the Vietnamese. So can you describe me, or in you in, in the war, you were a reporter uh, that long, can you tell me anything about how North Vietnamese people live? Uh, you know, under uh, Ho Chi Minh and communists. Uh, do you see anything, any book or anybody cover that? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I married a Vietnamese woman in 1964, Nina, and I'm so delighted to have done that. Now, her family had come south on an American refugee ship you know, in 1955. So many Vietnamese from North Vietnam when the Vietnam was partitioned in uh, basically 54, 55, took the option of coming south. Now, there, were, there was much publicity about that because don't forget, this was the middle of the Cold War. The Cold War even was developing. So therefore, any, any indication that communism was evil and failing was, was taken by American people and American politicians and the American media is an example of how terribly dangerous and, 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 and how, how it was indifferent to the fate of people, but the communist side. So there was a huge crusade in the United States. At that time, you had the McCarthyism, where the whole point of McCarthyism is who's a communist? Who lost China to the communists? So, you know, Americans were very much aware of, of what they thought the evils of communism and the Vietnamese people, those first of all who fled the North with good reason to the South, to the freedom of the South, and, and those that the American advisors and American aid were supporting in the late 50s and the early 60s were, you know, very primary primary interests of Americans before, you know, Noden Zeeum uh, became sort of uh, viewed as a liability by the United States. You know, he was very popular in the United States. Time magazine had several cover stories. Madame New, his uh, sister-in-law, often visited America. They were popular figures of anti-communism. I mean, I think Time Magazine called Zeeum the Churchill of Asia. So it's not as though the Vietnamese people and the Vietnamese cause was forgotten. In fact, in, I went there in 62, and as I say, through 65, we were doing lots of stories on Vietnamese, Vietnamese military, because the only Americans there were advisors. It was only when 65 came and there were, there were over a half a million American troops that the emphasis was less on what the Vietnamese were doing and more on what the Americans were doing. Now you may say, well, how could the fate of the Vietnamese people be forgotten? Well, as far as you know, the Vietnamese were concerned, the fate wasn't forgotten. You had your own government, you had your own military, and uh, you had support in your, your cities, and uh, and uh, you know the American view was we're you know we're supporting the South Vietnamese. We're doing support by sending our own troops there to be supportive 
to the to to what the South Vietnamese are doing. This eventually came of Vietnamization, where the American uh, President Nixon said, "Well, we're going to turn the war over to the South Vietnamese because." We feel they're in a position to continue fighting it. We'll give them all our equipment and, uh, and then left. But I don't think the, the, the Vietnamese people, as you say, were sort of a forgotten entity. You know, they had lots of aid. Americans were fighting there for Vietnamese people. What were they fighting for? To defend South Vietnam. So, now I'm aware that there were terrible brutalities inflicted by the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. But we're also aware that the nature of modern war, the, the aerial bombing, artillery strikes, uh, also inflicted you know, great harm on the Vietnamese people. But I think the it's not as though the, the Vietnamese people were forgotten at that time. They were very much a part of what I felt was our, you know, daily considerations, not just by the media, but by the, you know, thousands of Americans who were in Vietnam working in provinces, province advisors, and getting killed in the countryside, working with, with Vietnamese province chiefs, you know, giving aid and support to, to people, trying to come up with programs within the communities that would protect people, the Hamlet programs, to uh, start to develop local militia, to combat the Viet Cong. I mean, a lot of Americans were helping Vietnamese do that. There were a lot of very smart uh, Vietnamese officials and others who were working with Americans to come up with the kind of programs that would be successful. And uh, you, you, you're developing, you know, the hearts and minds philosophy was developed in Vietnam. They have never figured out how to do it, unfortunately. But to win the hearts and minds was a, a common phrase by uh, President Johnson and others. How do you help the Vietnamese people and how do you win them to our side? How do you help them support us without being seriously damaged by the Vietnamese? So I um, think that uh, I uh, perfectly right up until like 1963 and you was in Vietnam in 1963. What happened? Uh, why is that they um, overthrow Ngo Dinh Diem? Now Pentagon paper and many witnesses uh, said that um, American um, involved in that coup d'etat that uh, uh, overthrow Ngo Dinh Diem. Of course, American didn't kill Ngo Dinh Diem, but uh, some people even said, let it happen you know, by killing Ngo Dinh Diem. Can you tell me uh, what did you see during the time you were there and what is your opinion? Well, as they say, the first Buddhist crisis did indeed happen in 1963. And as a, as a reporter, we became very aware that there was a Buddhist unhappiness with the regime. Now, where did, that, where did that unhappiness stem from? Basically from Buddhist leadership in Hue and Saigon. Now, they were very media conscious, the Buddhists. They were getting in touch with journalists and presenting their, their view that the government policies were anti-Buddhist. They kept talking about the Xiam regime being, a, you know, he was a Catholic and that he was, they claimed, demanding that his senior officers become Catholics, convert, and that they felt that his leadership and those around him was damaging to Vietnam as a whole, but to them in particular. Now there were, you know, as journalists, we just we just cover wherever there seems to be a story. And that, of course, the Buddhist crisis became a story when Mel Brown took that famous picture during a Buddhist demonstration earlier in 1963 of an aged Buddhist monk 
self-immolating. That we, that it, it was a picture that, that was published around the world and it's a picture that it was later said that President Kennedy looked at that picture and decided, wow, we, this is unacceptable. We have to get rid of Zeehan. And as the course of the year, as the, as the, as the protests continued, and, uh, and within Saigon, the, the lines were drawn between the government forces and the military police and the Buddhists. Now, remembering Saigon had a 95% you know, Buddhist population. Mm -hmm. And I know very well at the time that most Vietnamese I knew supported the Buddhist side. And in, but in the course of time, the Vietnamese military, the leadership, or those that were not totally loyal to the regime, sought out American assistance to overthrow Xi'an. The, and that they, they got it in, in the sense that the Americans did not oppose it. Now, did the Americans help it to any degree? Not really, because the Vietnamese military had plenty of resources. But the Americans did not oppose it. If the Americans had opposed it, there would have been no coup d'etat. Now, I just want to explain that it's often thought that that photograph that Malcolm Brown took was the reason that Zeehan was overthrown. That's absolute rubbish, because it's clear in the record now that at the time of the Buddhist crisis, American support of Zeehan was eroding, because at that time they felt that he was certainly not listening to American advice in terms of military policies. His policies in the countryside had changed from the traditional village election of officials to appointments out of the, out of the, uh, out of the capital. There was concern amongst American advisors that the war policies weren't working. So the American sense of, of the value of Zeehan as, as a leader was eroding. Now, the Buddhist crisis pushed things along a little, but I, there's no doubt in my mind that sooner or later, the, the regime in the United States would have had confrontations. So I'd like to ask you one small question about that. You said that beside the Buddhist issue, uh, also the issue of the regime uh, of Modi regime and American uh, uh, disagreement about how to run the war. As, uh, I also heard and also in uh, the Pentagon paper that during the time uh, President Kennedy still in uh, power, he would uh, having some advisor talk to Zim about uh, sending uh, ground force troops into Vietnam and holding Zim. I post that fiercely. And that's one of the reasons why that make American unhappy about Zim. Do you know anything about that, about that or you make some comment on that? No, I don't know anything about the debate. I think about <coughs> President Kennedy's policies is whether he would have continued to to support the war because during the last month of his presidency, uh, Defense Secretary McNamara announced the first withdrawal of American forces. They were pulling Americans out by the end of the year. So the, after his death, the issue was <clears throat> to what degree will America continue supporting Vietnam? And President Johnson decided to go ahead. And then when Johnson started sending, you know, ground troops, something he had pledged not to do, the debate became, well, part of the debate was would President Kennedy have done that? And as I mentioned earlier, that debate is still unresolved because we don't know whether he would have or not. So um, I also re read some uh, book and also some uh, Pentagon paper that um, um, Mr. Ngoding Ziem opposed fiercely about the proposal from Americans saying that they will put in for ground force and because of his oppose. Who, who opposed it? Morning Zim opposed the ground troop uh, um, of uh, US American, uh, US force. 
So that's Who why... Who opposed that? Ngo Ding Ziem. Oh, uh, okay, sure, okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. And then that's why um, President Kennedy and, um, you know, American um, trade that they can uh, pull out all aid, all advisor from South Vietnam. And at that time, Ngo Ding Ziem and Ngo Ding Nhu would worry so much about that. No, I haven't heard that argument, but I'm sure it's probably been made in one of the many thousands of books. The later, after the coup d'etat, it was determined that No De Nu, the president's brother and chief advisor, had been making overtures through the Polish uh, ambassador, you, because you had the arrangement with the North and the South through the United Nations, that could have led to some kind of uh, negotiation with the North about the future. But it, 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 the record doesn't show that there was any, that this reached the ears of President Kennedy or that it was taken seriously. The issue was, I think, that the, there were South Vietnamese generals who developed opposition to no Zinziem, maybe because of his religion, maybe because they had personally been harmed by his decisions or they resented his ruling approach. They're the ones who initiated the coup idea. And uh, Ambassador Lodge there at the time was advised by the State Department, basically, don't oppose it. So the green lights were given. But the initiation came from the generals, there's no doubt about it. Now, whether behind the scenes that was, you know, Zeehan's general attitude towards Americans flavored American policy, but don't forget at the time, uh, the United States believed that South Vietnam was an important player in the, in the, in the Cold War. I mentioned the dominoes. South Vietnam was the critical domino. If they indeed had a leader in South Vietnam willing to come to terms with North Vietnam at that time, you know, there would have been resistance in the United States because the whole point of policy in the United States was to prevent <laughs> a deal with the communists. Uh, you may know that in 1964, President Charles de Gaulle of France uh, visited Cambodia and he presented the idea of a neutralized Indochina, keeping everything in place, neutral. And that idea didn't go down at all well with the Americans. Now at that point, you know, you also have to know that the Americans were convinced that a land war launched by Americans in, in, in Vietnam would be successful. I don't think there's any doubt that American military leadership believed that they would succeed in a land war, forgetting that the French had also believed they would succeed in a land war that just a few years earlier had, had been defeated. So, um, and uh, many uh, winners still uh, uh, alive nowadays, and then I in interview a few. They said in 1965, I think that uh, early March 1965, that um, 3,500 Marines uh, ship into uh, Da Nang. Yeah. And uh, at that time... Excuse me. Yeah. That's okay. So at that time, um, they didn't notify the South Vietnamese government. At that time, uh, I think uh, Mr. Phan Hi Quoc, he's like to act like um, Prime Minister of the country, and uh, they, they <coughs> were not informed uh, that American ODD sent troops uh, to the border, uh, I mean, to the coast of Vietnam. Uh, when you were there, and did you witness anything? Or did, did, were you there at the time Han Da Nang received 35 first uh, U.S. Marine? No, I didn't. I was not in Da Nang. I was in Saigon, but there was an AP photographer there and a reporter because the day before, the journalists at the Da Nang Press Center were advised to go to that particular beach in Da Nang Bay and wait for an event. Now, they, I guess the American military would say that they didn't advise 
the landing in advance for security reasons, because this was an area that was basically uninhabited. It was a beach relatively close to the city, but it was also close to the mountain area. And Da Nang, there was you know, quite a few you know, Viet Cong agents and, and military groups hanging around that area. So I think the Americans would argue, look, we security reasons, we wanted to make that invasion as quietly as possible in advance. I don't think that's at all unusual. Don't forget, two years ago when the bin Laden was killed in Pakistan, the Americans didn't tell the Pakistanis that they were going in. So I don't think that would be too surprising. And I don't think it's sort of an insulting to the South Vietnamese. I think it was just a matter of, you know, the, the certainly the Americans had made it clear to the Vietnamese they were interested in in supporting the war. So people, uh, that's why they uh, uh, criticized that Americans didn't understand much about Vietnamese culture or history. Because we live next to China, we defend our independence, you know, every day. Um, you know, China already uh, defeat most of the small countries around them and make them become most uh, occupy uh, or uh, most of Asia. That's why that uh, uh, of, uh, foreign uh, group troop in uh, inside uh, Vietnam will be a very defended to the people. That's why Ho Chi Minh uses it like a propaganda and asking people go uh, to fight, fight because American invaded uh, a foreign troop invaded again. What do you have to say about that? I think the Americans made every effort to persuade President Zian and later military leaders to do all they could to develop allegiance to the Saigon government. That's where millions of dollars of American aid was presented. They're coming up with policies I mentioned earlier about you know, supporting the, the population, the hearts and minds issue. But as we know in retrospect, that there were a lot of things went wrong not only with the American military effort, but within the Vietnamese government structure. The corruption, the incompetence of both Americans and Vietnamese. Now, certainly the Americans did not know anything about Vietnamese culture. There were some Americans, or a lot of Americans, who did take the trouble of learning about it and they were working within the embassy or they went into the countryside. But basically, Vietnam had never figured in, in America's historical landscape. And, and if you would have said that America has no, shouldn't be there because they don't know anything about Vietnam, then what would have taken place? I mean, it's not as though the Vietnamese resisted America's efforts in South Vietnam. I mean, the South Vietnam Vietnamese, I got the impression, wanted American assistance and help. But I, I agree, Americans didn't know anything about Vietnam then. They still don't know anything about Vietnam. But the nature of wars are that, you know, America fought World War II against the Japanese, not knowing anything about Japanese, or supported China without knowing much about China. War is war. It has its own culture. You know, it has its own, now the success of a war and the failure depends to some degree on awareness of culture. That basically uh, military actions have their own dynamic. And that was the case in Vietnam. The issue, the key issue, was could American troops break the will of the North Vietnamese? Could they destroy uh, so many North Vietnamese soldiers and equipment that the North would no longer fight? That was Westmoreland's policy. It was a struggle basically fought in the mountains between two great armies. And the Americans retreated from battle I mean, that it wasn't a conclusive, it wasn't a, a, a conclusive engagement. I mean, General Westmoreland, up to the time of his death, said we never lost a battle. That's a, that one. But I we lost the war. war. That's the <laughs> next question. Okay, why go ahead. Is, why is that we didn't lose any battle? 
but we lost the war. Well, I could talk about that for a while because I covered a lot of battles. Because when American troops came to Vietnam in 1965, I spent the next four years covering only American actions. Why did I do that? Because I worked for the Associated Press, an American news organization, uh, with half a million American troops in Vietnam. They wanted to know what was happening. They wanted to know what was happening to the soldiers. They wanted to know, get assessments of how the war was going, who was winning, who was losing, and me and other reporters for the AP and other news organizations primarily covered that story. Now you have to, there's a lot of aspects to, 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 to think about or, or to know as to the reason that America decided that to give up fighting that war. And I think one of the reasons was that from the beginning, U.S. leadership believed it was a little war. McNamara called it limited war. Uh, Lyndon Johnson sent in 3,500 Marines. It was in February, March of 1965. Then he sent in another 15,000 with the 1st Division, and at the end of the year there were oh, 120,000. Then he kept sending more and more uh, in the belief that each new division would win victory. Now why did he think that? A lot of it was wishful thinking. It was also the view of the American commanders in Vietnam, General Westmoreland and those around him, that incrementally, as I say, with each new division, they were closer to victory. And technically, that would have been fine if indeed the North Vietnamese had not been able to resupply down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, resupply men, supplies day after day, eventually enlarging the trail to a four-lane highway, basically, as, a, as we got into the war. So the American objectives were not being met, even though battles, one after the other, were relatively successful. And the way it worked was this. One of the battles I covered was the Eardrang Valley in, uh, I think, November, September, or October of 1965, when the 1st Cavalry Division uh, went on a, what they call a search and clear operation near the Cambodian border. That turned into the, one of the biggest battles of the war, because waiting, having based in that particular mountain area on the Cambodian border were two or three very competent North Vietnamese divisions. They were sort of moving through. They engaged the Americans in a three or four day action that left 360 Americans dead and a lot of North Vietnamese dead. And, and eventually the North Vietnamese withdrew. The Americans withdrew and that was claimed to be a victory. Uh, because the body count showed that while there were 365 Americans killed, there may be 1,000, 2,000 North Vietnamese killed. That went into the column of victory. So General Westmoreland said, ha, we have a victory. But for the American public, uh, uh, the details of that action, which later became famous in the, the movie We Were Soldiers, you know, and uh, the American public thinking, well, is that, is that all it takes, one big battle? But in fact, America kept refighting that battle in the Eardrang Valley for the next four years because the kind of battles that Westmoreland was talking about were not like World War II, when you, when you D-Day, June 6th, you land, you, you take a French community, you take Paris, you keep moving on towards Berlin. No, because most of the battles in the highlands of Vietnam were over distant hills and valleys that the U.S. would retreat from. Now, the communist side would retreat too, but the U.S. would pull back and invariably throughout the war, 
units of North Vietnamese that lost thousands of men would reinforce over six or eight months and be back in action, requiring the Americans to go and fight another battle. And as time went on, you know, the, the casualty toll of American soldiers rose. The draft meant that more and more young American kids were being sent to Vietnam and discontent within the American public was growing because college students were resisting. There was anti-war elements from the beginning of the war in the United States. And so the series of, of what seemed victories were not conclusive military actions. They weren't conclusive. They beat the communists, but the communists were willing to take casualties to a far greater degree than the United States military understood. So uh, thank you for explaining that. Um, uh, we're talking about offensive, uh, dead offensive 1968. Um, many people cover this one already, but uh, I just want to ask you that uh, where would you and then um, uh, there's a photo, very, very famous photo of Eddie Adam uh, having uh, a general Luan, you know, pointing a gun to a um, Viet Cong insurgency. People didn't know it because he dressed, um, I mean, like a civilian that uh, shook the whole world uh, and uh, thinking of how, you know, brutally South Vietnamese government and military was uh, and um, make people thinking that American uh, supporting the wrong side. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, at in Hue, there was about over 5,000 killed. Uh, I have a list that, that, that we see with, uh, with North Vietnamese brought into the city and hunt for people that they're gonna kill. And uh, I interview a few that uh, survived from that list. And uh, uh, we saw all that. Uh, we Vietnamese, we know that very well, but on the press uh, in Western have very little uh, report about it. Even the book for Mr. Stanley Canal, he have only a, a small picture of the lady, she crying, hugging her dead, uh, her daughter, her son, dead body. Um, so why is that? Uh, there's, I uh, can see the, a little bit uh, of, of balance over there, um, you know, from reporting one picture of one VC that uh, got killed and five, over 5,000 people were murdered in Hue, same time, same different location. Why is that one picture so important to the uh, Western press and then 5,000 uh, people got murdered in Hue? Well, I think I'll start by saying that, you know, if, if people believe that one photograph can change American policy, they're insane. Do you think President Obama reacts to, to uh, pictures out of Syria honestly? We had pictures a few weeks ago of 1,500 people gassed. And President Obama said, well, you know, we've got to stop this. We're not stopping it. You know, we're not stopping it. The, what pictures do, they attract attention of the public to what's happening in some part of the world. And the attention of the public requires the government sometimes to do something about it, but not always. Now, the main reason that there's a lot of debate about the Tet Offensive, and it continues. There's half a dozen books and there will be more. Is that it, it, it's, you have to remember that up to the time of the Tet Offensive, President Johnson and General Westmoreland and officials in Saigon were saying the war is won. Coma, the chief of pacification, gave a press conference a week before and said, you can drive from the Mekong Delta to the DMZ with one. General Frederick Weyand, who I knew very well, uh, gave an interview to a Newsweek guy and said, the communists have been pushed into Cambodia in the south. 
they're out of it. Uh, General Westmoreland went to, came to Washington in November of, of, of 67 and said, it's over, we've got victory, there's light at the end of the tunnel, we are there. And journalists, New York Times, the top military analyst came, wrote a four part series about how it was over, a great American victory, that the communists had left the battlefield and the bombing was restraining them from reinforcing. So this was the attitude now, when Tet came, I was there with my wife and two children at that point in Saigon. And the city was erupting in celebration. I mean, most of the military were on leave, the Vietnamese military. The Americans never had leave per se, but the Vietnamese military. There were celebrations in Saigon, there were firecrackers. But would they have some sort of agreement for us? Uh, were they having some sort of ceasefire agreement between both sides to say No, 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 there's nothing. No, no. There was, well, whatever, whatever may have been, there was no, yes, to were. my understanding, any sort of understanding that it ever worked in the past. Whatever you talked about, sort of a, a ceasefire in place, they, they, if there were any spoken about, they never existed. You know, they never really functioned because there was always, there were so many guns and so much, you know, so, so much distrust on both sides that whatever may have been indicated about <clears throat> the communist, you know, withdrawal from from doing it, who would have believed it anyway? I mean, there was so much dis total distrust, you know, total distrust between both sides. The, the point was, there was no information that reached official ears that the communists were in any way positioned to do anything. The stage was set in the United States for Americans to believe that President Johnson's policies and Westmoreland's policies had won the war. Johnson was moving into a re-election phase. We now know what happened. While the U.S. was celebrating and South Vietnamese, I, I guess, were also celebrating the, the government, the communist side was infiltrating into 40 major base areas in communities. They were coming in and we coming in in flower trucks, sending weapons and vegetables, and they were being hidden all around Saigon and in graveyards. They were doing that to cities all over the all over the country. When it erupted the way it did, could you imagine that why there was a complete condemnation of of what American policymakers were saying. Where did these people come from? Isn't the war meant to be over? Now, we, we, we covered the war initially at the same kind of surprise that anyone else would have. Where are all these communists coming from? How are they in the grounds of the embassy? Why are they taking over Chalon? What about all these other communists? Way fell. What happened to Huey? How did all this happen? Sure, there was shock and surprise. As the days went on, it was clear, certainly with American and, and Vietnamese, you know, uh, regrouping, that they were pushing, they killed a lot of the Viet Cong, they pushed them out, and you, within a few months, after a mini tet there was a, they had stability. But for American leaders, for President Johnson, he got the shock of his life. We know that because after the Tet Offensive, he called a meeting of his, what they called the wise man, and including Clark Clifford, who had been named as defense secretary to follow McNamara, said, what is going on in Vietnam? And the conclusion a few weeks later by Clark Clifford was, Mr. President, we have no plan for victory. 
It'll be endless. And this came with a request from General Westmoreland for 250,000 more troops. Now, they're already nearly 600,000. So Johnson looked at that request and talked to Clark Clifford and the wise man and said, this is crazy. I cannot trust my military leaders. He fired Westmoreland. And then he moved to initiate serious talks with North Vietnam, and he quit from re-election. Now, in the years since, you know, I, I kept in touch with Westmoreland. I saw him quite a few times after the war. And I sort of liked him. But his, the criticism of Westmoreland has risen to an alarming degree. I mean, there's a, you know, a profile, a book on Westmoreland recently that attacked every little bit of his policies. You know, military historians are taking him apart on, and challenging, you know, and claiming that his tactics were just the worst possible you know, uh, ways to implement a policy of, of, of sustaining a South Vietnamese state. But that's how, that's my view of the, of, of, of what happened at Tet. Now the photographs, you mentioned, the, you mentioned Huey. Now that Huey battle was covered. I didn't cover Huey because I was in the Mekong Delta and a lot of other, we had several reporters and photographers. That battle was well covered. And there were Vietnamese units involved in that battle that were well covered. In fact, there were plenty of pictures of the Vietnamese flag being raised, South Vietnamese flag being raised over Hue. The Marines helped put it there. After some time, it emerged that a terrible atrocity may have been committed by the Vietnamese, South Viet North Vietnamese. And that was covered by the media. It's often said, well, the media didn't do anything. Larry Burroughs of Life magazine was one who went up there, watched the digging, the bodies being taken out and put into plastic bags. He had a cover picture in Life magazine of a grieving Vietnamese woman over a body of a husband. Horst Fass, AP photographer, had similar pictures. These pictures were and stories were written. At that point in time, the sort of world had shifted to other aspects of Vietnam or other aspects of news. So the, but, I, but it's not as though the media concealed it or was indifferent. At that point in time, you know, move, news moves on back and forth and, uh, and that was covered, but it didn't get the attention that six weeks earlier the Tet Offensive have got, but that's the nature of news. I think want to say, uh, you explained very well, and uh, I mean your point of view and everything, but I think want to say, uh, say, but you say part of it about the uh, attention of the public. At that time, you know, uh, same time the picture of Eddie Adam came out, and a few story and a photo of 5,000 5, people got killed. But it seems like people don't pay much attention on the 5,000 people. They rather pay attention on the area and photo. Um, do you, do you well, you know, that, that same, that? I've got clippings. The, the day that Eddie Adams' picture was published, there was a fantastic picture of a ma Vietnamese man with his dead wife, child, and a story about he, how the communists killed him, how it would kill his family. There's a lot of stuff about communist atrocities. There were journalists killed by the communists, murdered in Chalon, some of my good friends, murdered. They were well publicized. They're well publicized. Eddie's picture is, 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 is immortal. The kind of picture that catches a moment but that, that picture you know, did not change American policy. That wasn't what changed American policy. What changed American policy was the failure of its military 
effort. Westmoreland's demand for a quarter of a million more troops and President Johnson saying no more. And supported by an American public that already was moving away from support of the war. Initially, the American public, those who thought about it, supported it. The anti-war movement was very strong and active by the late 1960s. It's undeniably so. College campuses erupting in what protest. Do you, what do you think about the anti-war movement in the United States? I saw them raising um, a Viet Cong flag and uh, you know North Vietnamese flag. I saw uh, Jane Fonda who was sitting in a chair of anti-war, I'm um, anti-aircraft um, pointed into, I mean, the sky. Uh, and calling, you know, pilot, uh, you know, you are committing criminal, so far and so on. Um, Why all the American troops is uh, in the battlefield fighting with the enemy, and uh, the citizen over here raising the enemy flag, and uh, a uh, famous actress, uh, you know, going to uh, enemy uh, soil and uh, you know, pointing gun to pilot, uh, uh, U.S. pilot. What do you think about that? It's called democracy popular opinions. You know, most 70% of Americans don't want American involvement in Syria, military involvement at all. Today, 70%. Even though you could say, but look, it's terrible what's happening in Syria and what's happening could affect Israel and all of America's allies. And Americans are saying, forget it. We don't want anything militarily to do with Syria. Okay, now having said that, in America it is a democracy. People are free to protest. I remember myself with Horst Bass, we were visiting uh, New York in uh, March of 68 after the Tet Offensive. And the office said, oh, there's a demonstration, anti-war demonstration in Central Park, go and have a look at it. And we saw hundreds of young men and women marching around Central Park with VC flags and with pictures of Ho Chi Minh, marching around in demonstrations. And they had various slogans attacking Lyndon Johnson and, and you know, LBJ, LBJ, how many kids have you killed today sort of thing. It's a response of the public to something they feel the country shouldn't be doing. So it was a, it, you know, that is part of what we have here, a democracy, and it's, about, it's up to the government to convince people their policies are just and worthy. And if it doesn't succeed, people are gonna protest. Like the second Iraq war, America supported George Bush going in to destroy Saddam Hussein's government because he had weapons of mass destruction. When he didn't find any, the American public says, what are you doing there? Now, the U.S. stayed 10 years, spent a trillion dollars, and lost 4,500 dead, and scores, some of them terribly wounded. But the public turned against it. it it's, that's, yeah, that's what I'd say about the anti-war movement. Yes, sir. But uh, going to the enemy uh, soil, like Jane Fonda, you think that they've gone too far now? Right now, people... A protest on uh, you know Syria uh, war. I uh, agree with that, but uh, the point is the gun to well, you know, the U.S. has a legal system that if if Americans were implicated in in uh, you know uh, supporting an enemy uh, side in 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 direct violation of American security, they would take action. That if a person gets up and says, you know, uh, this is a bad war, you know, we should get out of there and, and uh, Ho Chi Minh's a better man, you're not going to put him in jail. That's, you know, that's, it, that's it, opinion. But that's going, just opinion. Yeah. But going to the enemy soy and pointing gun in there, I don't see that uh, opinion anymore. It's going beyond opinion, don't you think? To do what? To, to do, do like Chen Fonda did? 
You think Jane Fonda's a criminal <laughs> for doing uh, that? So I don't think a criminal, but she gone too far. Well, it's your opinion. You can you can believe that. A lot of American soldiers agree with you, but most Americans have long forgiven Jane Fonda. Hello. <laughs> Long forgiven. Well, we we forgive her. We never forget her. <laughs> well, that's fine. But you yes, know, you're yes. entitled. You know, and I I understand that. Yes, yes. You're entitled to your your opinion. Yes. But yes, you know, sir. most Americans don't. They've made her a rich woman since then, and she's yes, a pretty yes. popular movie star. Yes. yes still. Yes, that really wounded me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, when you were in Vietnam, uh, you know the man by um, Pam Sunan. You know, Pham Sun. Yeah, of course. He yeah. was just, he was sort of a neighbor. He was, would see him every day around town. Whenever I was in Saigon, Ahn would be moving around the center of Saigon in a coffee shop or other thing. After the war, he revealed that he two star general of the North Vietnam. Please, um, have you ever wondered that uh, he had that sort of high? ranking uh, and belong to North Vietnam during the time you know him and work with him? Oh, I, he worked initially for Reuters. You know, think about the media in Vietnam was very competitive. And uh, all of the international news organizations hired Vietnamese to help them. I mean, with the language, with uh, local culture, political, awareness. We had several in the AP Bureau over time who would assist in the reporters. We had reporters who would cover, you know, the political side of the war in Saigon. So they, we had, you know, Vietnamese who would assist them. An was one of these who assisted, first of all, Reuters and eventually Time Magazine. He was on their staff. So I would see An around and and say hello and have a coffee with them. But, you know, I, I wasn't really interested. I was a war reporter and I, I was <laughs> covering action. And I would we'd chat, but we never had any serious discussions. The main reason being that he wasn't working for the AP. So I wasn't about to tell him anything I was doing or planning to do uh, because he worked for a competing news organization. And, they, and I wasn't interested in sort of hearing his view because, because we had our own sources of information. But he was very pleasant and agreeable, and I remember at Brodard's and, and other restaurants he'd be sitting with he, he was a center of, of Vietnamese media there. They looked up to him, definitely. Well, we media, we don't look up to him. <laughs> During the war, the yes. Vietnamese Saigon media looked up to Pham Su and An. Now they have a different feeling now. Mm -hmm. But they looked up to him, and An would be moving around, and he was always cheerful. And I didn't know much about his background. I was not interested. We didn't hire him. At the fall of Saigon that I covered, I remember An. I asked him, how come you're not leaving? Because he said his wife and children out. He said, well, he was staying because of his aged mother couldn't go and he wanted to support her. So it was with great surprise I was to learn several years later, I mean it was in the early 80s I believe, that he was actually a spy and had been given official recognition by the communist side. You know, I was shocked to hear it. But I can tell you I was influenced not at all by anything he said because we never did discuss issues about the war. Now maybe other reporters can't say that, but I can say it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, quite a few times. When was the first time and what was your first impression? Well, I returned in 1976 when President Carter sent a mission, what they call the MIA mission. It was a delegation of uh, eight well-known Americans uh, who checking into reports that Americans were still being held in Vietnam. 
and it included a congressman or two, or the leader of the Automobile Workers Union, and others, and there were four or five reporters included. I was the AP. And at that time, we stayed in Hanoi and also went to Saigon. And I was shocked, not so much by Hanoi, but by Saigon, because the whole city was closed down. There was not one shop open. This was a year after the war, maybe a year and a half after the war had ended. And the communist side had imposed a total controls over, over the private enterprise. And I did meet a couple of our Vietnamese staff who had wanted to remain in the city rather than coming to the United States. And it was a sort of a, a shocking scene. But I was aware of it because other, other, others had reported it. So I did an account of what I'd seen there. Then I returned in 1979 when the then UN Secretary General Kurt Baldheim made a visit to several Asian countries, including Vietnam. And I was one of five reporters invited to go with him, AP. And we went to North Vietnam, uh, Hanoi, and then we came back to Saigon. Now, during that trip, we visited the northern, north, north, northern border area where the Chinese had invaded earlier that year. So we were escorted by an officer and looked around some of the locales that had been, that had been damaged. And the Vietnamese government complained to uh, the Attorney General of what they, of the Chinese invasion. So we wrote all that. I was doing a story every day about both visits. So I have quite a, then I didn't return until 1985 when I was with CNN and I did 25 reports on the war and with based on a lot of material we got from the Pentagon military action pictures, plus interviews and and went down the part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, as much as we could get. Now we're under supervision of a Vietnamese guide, but we were able to sort of give a sense of what was happening in the country. At that point, the economy still hadn't, was not up and running. Saigon was still closed down. And, uh, you know, it was clear that the system wasn't economically wasn't working. Then I'm not sure, I think in the 90s, I returned again in 1995. And uh, at this point, I, I knew Vietnamese and I was living in Washington, D.C. and met them and they were starting to work with the communist government on sort of revitalizing the economy in the Chinese model. And by 1995, the picture had changed quite a lot. There were businesses, particularly in, in Saigon, flourishing. And it was a, and I've been back twice since then. So um, there was about 100,000 of uh, South Vietnamese uh, officer and um, military was in prison. Many of them died uh, by hard labor. Many of them executed. Uh, we don't see much of the coverage um, you know, from Western about them. Uh, well, you, you have been coverage about them? You were in Vietnam several times. No, well, at that point, I was most of the time I was in Africa in the Middle East. But certainly there were lots of stories in the Associated Press and others from refugees who'd come out and were complaining about it. I mean, the boat people, I did a series of stories on the Vietnamese boat people. I guess in 78, 79, I traveled with Eddie Adams, our last assignment for the, my last assignment for the AP. And one of the stories was on the boat people in Malaysia and the different islands they were located. And they had, of course, stories. But there was a lot of information written about that time. Don't forget the Khmer Rouge were very active in Cambodia. So it was, 
you know, sort of the unfortunate legacy of the war, the Biddle legacy, was every all Americans knew pretty well that the Vietnamese that had that really should have been evacuated at the time of the collapse were not. And I mean to this day you read articles by government of American government officials and others who despair that there wasn't enough done to help them. I mean, Frank Snap, who did the great book Decent Interval, which talks about uh, Henry Kissinger's deal with the Chinese to allow what they called a two-year interval uh, to, uh, to before the final assault. Uh, he, he still talks about his memories of the collapse of the country and how he regrets that uh, not near enough was done to help Vietnamese leave. He blames the ambassador at the time to because his belief or the ambassador's belief that it could all be resolved diplomatically in the end. But no, there was a great, and it's a great shame of America that that happened, that they, that the end came so violently and that so many thousands of lives were affected and how punishment given to the military and, and government leadership and others was sort of not part of the peace agreement that had been signed in 1973. It's a shame. So uh, there are about at least five generals of South Vietnamese Army rank uh, and also soldier. Um, I don't see much on uh, Western press uh, cover any. Well, one of the reasons was that there was no access of Western press. I stayed in, I stayed in the fall of Saigon, and where I was allowed to stay ten days. Then me and most of the others were ordered out, and then after twenty-five days, all of the press was sent out, and so there was a, just a blank page in in Vietnam after the war. It was just the information trickled out in bits and pieces. Some of those officers came out in the 80s. The full picture was not known for years. And by then, the public's attentions had moved on. However, the American government kept bringing Vietnamese here, helping them, you know, bringing families as best they could from Vietnam. It was not forgotten, but for the general public, you know, the war was, was sort of over. And, I, and, and a lot has been written since, but it's hard to, to, to I, I don't know really what you're looking for. Do you want the American public to sort of rise up in anger? Or, you know, so much happens in the world that is terrible. And, and, and it's, as time went on, the story came out. It's been well documented. Uh, does the average American know about it? Probably not. Uh, so um, I'm talking about this, um, the 10,000 day war um, documentary. That's a very famous one, and that's what uh, you know uh, broadcast on many um, channel, um, PBS, and a lot of other channel. Uh, and uh, what role do you play in that um, documentary, sir? Yeah, the 10,000 day, well, well, the name says it, 1945 to 1975. That was the official sort of beginning and ending of the war. That, that program was based on a BBC program on World War II that was very popular. And the BBC program looked at as many of the important figures of all sides and to talk about and using video from different aspects of the war to discuss the war in full. I think there were 50 episodes. It's still running. Now, Canadian TV producer Michael McClear, who had done documentaries in, in Canada and who was an, an, an anchor for a popular television station, decided in you know, the late 1970s to do a version of the BBC war 
on the Vietnam War. So he assembled a team of, of uh, producers, including Don North, and uh, he called me and uh, explained the project, and he said they had 100 interviews scheduled. Would I do as many as I could? And he would do some and others. And would I write the series? So I took leave from the Associated Press and started doing interviews, lots of interviews with General Westmoreland and all the former ambassadors, uh, a lot of the other generals. And uh, so in the end, we had, we had 100 interviews. There were, I think, I interviewed General Tran Van Dong, I mean, Pham Van Dong. There was Bui Ziem was interviewed. I didn't interview him, but others. There were about eight or ten South Vietnamese. There was six, five or six North Vietnamese. In, 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 including, uh, in, you know, some of the, some of those involved in, in negotiating with Kissinger, uh, General Tran Van Tung. We had a brief interview someone made with Von Nguyen Jop, and uh, also we covered the French period. I went to Paris and interviewed seven or eight of the military people involved in the uh, in the. Uh, later stages of the French War, and we put all that together into a 26-part series. And uh, we divided it into, you know, a general look at the, at the war, then, then uh, the early period, rise of Ho Chi Minh, French colonialism, through you know American, through the through the Diem battle Diem Bien Phu, American involvement, the fall of Ziem, boom boom boom, through to the to 1975. It was done in about a year, and it was it's been shown hundreds of times. In fact, there's a new DVD selection just put out by Time Warner of the 10,000 Day War. It's had generally good reviews. I think all the reviews have been quite good, those who are interested. And that's the 10,000 day war. So uh, watching that, I think that's the most of people like you mentioned, uh, um, uh, I think that um, for like the Vietnamese and the Vietnam veteran, they uh, I let the Vietnam veteran talk about them, but for Vietnamese side and Vietnamese American, most of people came here because they either both people or they got out uh, a hurry, uh, left everything uh, when the war ended, and uh, people were in prison for many years and uh, finally got uh, settled here. So they feel like the movie, um, uh, for they, they complain for several reasons, like uh, uh, how Ho Chi Minh was portrayed to their view, Ho Chi Minh you know, a nationalist and who done a lot of things for the country, who kick out France and kick out American and bring independence, happiness and, uh, you know, prosperity to the country. In the fact, they don't see that. So, um, what are you, um, respond to that, uh, people? Well, you know, everyone's country? entitled to their opinion. <laughs> Let's face it. And I tell you, if I'd been in a concentration camp for 10 years, and came out and watched the 10,000 day war, I'd say, well, why don't they talk about me and what I've suffered? The thing is that that program looked, we interviewed the important figures involved in the war, all the American ambassadors, you know, several of the major generals, including Westmoreland. We talked to General Kuhn, Nguyen Cao Khi, others, Bui Zim, other important South Vietnamese. We talked to the North Vietnamese. Now, I know some of the North Vietnamese were said silly things like, well, the Amer South were American puppets and that, but that's, they always use that comment. They're probably saying it today. But if they said it, okay, we weren't about to censor it out. But there was the, there was the we had the best possible grouping of people. There's been nothing like it since. I think Stanley Cano had a, a, a PBS pro, uh, similar program. 
but we did the best we could to get a historical account of what went on. You know, sure, there are thousands of stories, bitter, angry, unhappy stories from Vietnam. It was a war, millions were killed. We just did a historical picture of it. It's just our part of it. Now, others will argue. And that's what a democracy is all about, arguing. And, and the opportunity, though, is for others to put their point of view out. And there's been a lot of written material, blogging, and books on the experiences of bitter experiences of South Vietnamese under the rule of the, the communist side. I mean, there's lots of stuff. It's there in the record. So, um, what do you respond to the people saying that um, American press contribute a lot to the loss of South Vietnam? How, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I've heard that a lot. You know, going back to, to antiquity, in Greek times, the phrase was born, you know, kill the messenger. And it was realized that the bearers of bad news were always unpopular. Like if you're at the capital and your army is being defeated in the field and you have someone coming and say, we're being defeated. The person who brought that news was sometimes punished. <laughs> the point is the person who brought the news was simply bringing information. And so the idea of killing the messenger <clears throat> is part of this idea that the press contributed to the loss of the war in Vietnam. That Eddie Adams' image, Malcolm Brown's picture, different images, stories of the press contributed. Now mentioned earlier the University of Texas symposium conference in Washington, a very important conference with 15, 20 of the top experts on Vietnam and the war meeting. I looked at all the different aspects of what they're discussing. You know something? Not one discussion on the media. There's not one journalist invited. If you read recent histories of Vietnam, either by revisionists who were saying we should have won the war, or those who sit back and say, well, it was a historically. The revisionists say the press were stupid. They got all these stories from the Caravel Bar. They don't rate. And the other historians sort of don't talk about media much because they know different. They've seen the secret documents. They've seen government studies. They know that Lyndon Johnson, on one hand, may have been influenced by Eddie Adams' picture, but it already made up his mind that what he wanted to do picture or no picture, that picture wasn't conclusive, as it was with the other decisions of the war. You know, the decision of Johnson to go into Vietnam in the first place wasn't based on media reporting. His decision to pull out, media wasn't saying, we demanding that he not run for office. So I think there's been, there's an, there are some who have an exaggerated view of, of media's role. You know, media was, we did the best we could. Now, I was in Vietnam from 62 to, lived there 62 to 70, eight years. And then I kept going back for months at a time until the fall. In that time, I did a thousand, two thousand stories, the majority in the battlefield. In the first three years with Vietnamese soldiers, the rest of it with American soldiers. I was working for the Associated Press. The stories were distributed to 2,400 daily newspapers that existed at that time. These stories were clipped out by families and sent back to the soldiers. 
They would read what I was doing within two or three weeks of I was doing it. Rarely, if ever, was I ever denied re-entry with the unit. Rarely, if ever, was I accosted by an officer or a general or a soldier and saying you were destroying the war effort. You know what they said? Thanks for being with us. Thanks for telling our story. Because a lot of the stories I and others wrote were very positive stories about Vietnamese and Americans. But every now and again, there were negative stories. The negative stories are remembered. The positive stories are not. I went to, a, to I was invited to the University of Texas at Lubbock four or five years ago to speak to present the press view of the war at a, at a conference of veterans. And I said pretty much what I'm telling you now. I said, we went there, we went out in the field with you guys, 60 over 60 reporters were killed. We did our best to tell what we saw and what we felt was going on. And I'm pleased to say the response was quite positive from that audience. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask you a small thing uh, from the last statement. You said that, um, you know, the press go there and, you know, they uh, report the news. They don't make the news or they don't really, maybe longer than that. After the Tate offense that he came and, uh, you know, looking at Vietnam and he came home with his long report and he's saying that, well, Mr. President, it's a unwinnable war, please end the war. Do you think that uh, professional or what, what do you think about that, Mr. Krankai, uh, I mean, statement? You know, Walter Cronkite at the time was the most important American broadcaster news. And his reputation remains very strong. Now he was in a, he, he, he made a judgment that others were making judgments, other journalis journalists, and it wasn't that unusual for, for opinion makers in newspapers to, to, to talk about the war and, and their own, with their own viewpoint. Joseph Elsop, working for the Washington Post, was the most prominent journalist of his time. He supported the war totally. And his view of the Tet Offensive was it was a great victory. Walter Cronkite visited Vietnam and he came up with the feeling that it was going to take much longer than the American public had expected. That was the, basically the sense of his comments. We're not going to win this thing for a long time. You know, he had every right to say it. I mean, you cannot, <laughs> you, 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 you cannot sort of expect him to not express himself when he's risked his life, you know, coming to Vietnam and going out with the troops. Now, there's one other point that I think I should make about media, which is a very significant reality. In America's wars, censorship was implemented. World War I, World War II, the Korean War. The government decreed censorship and the American media accepted it. That meant that photographs and news dispatches were checked by military censors before they were sent out. And the military censor had the final word. And media accepted that. There were other occasions when America was involved in smaller actions in Latin America or elsewhere that no censorship was implemented because they were smaller occasions and reporters could do and they were they had to ask permission to be with American troops 
because there's no God-given right that American reporters can cover military. You have to get the military permission to do it. So they would do it. But now Vietnam came and the U.S. government decided not to implement censorship. President Kennedy in his, his period was sending advisors and uh, the record shows that while he was not happy with what reporters were writing, particularly David Halberstam and some others of us in the early period, he was confident that he could persuade publishers to pull back. He was confident he could persuade publishers to support the war. And actually, he did a pretty good job. Now, Lyndon Johnson's period, according to Secretary of State Dean Rush, they did consider censorship. They considered censorship in 64, 65, but they dropped the idea because they realized that to impose the kind of censorship that existed in World War II and World War I would have brought into operation all the machinery of government that covers censorship. You know, that, that information at home would be controlled, that public protests would be controlled because that's what censorship and, and you know national interests are primary so if you start int introducing censorship you've got to control many aspects of society and they did not feel that the american public was ready to accept the imposition of those controls they didn't impose censorship the military allowed free access of journalists. They did not interfere in photographs and information we sent out. Now, the South Vietnamese did for a few years. The third, under the Xiom regime, they controlled media or tried to, but the U.S. military didn't. We were under no restraints. The restraints we were under were be accurate, tell the truth, be honest, you know, and, and also be competitive. And so that, they're the, that's what I did during the war, all the other reporters. We were not constrained. We were constrained by the requirement to be truthful, accurate, and be sort of intelligent about what we were doing. That's why you see all the variety of pictures and stories. The U.S. government said, we don't care. Now, things have changed since then because the U.S. military after Vietnam decided, well, we can't, in future, we have to exercise control even though the U.S. government is unwilling to. So within the Defense Department, they figured out that they could restrict reporters moving amongst the military, perfectly entitled to do that under the, under the law. And so in the 1980s and the uh, in actions in the Caribbean, Panama and, and elsewhere, and in the first Gulf War, the Pentagon did start preventing reporters from moving around to any great degree. And by the second Gulf War in Iraq, they had a system of accreditation called embedding, meaning that any reporter wanting to cover American troops would require to sign a document of several pages that would mean working under the supervision of an officer that all photographs and uh, written material would be censored uh, and these kind of restrictions. And you have to sign that paper if you wanted to work with American troops and work with and go on supporting them and, 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 and to be supported by the military. And you know, hundreds of Americans did that. That's the system they have now. Of course, ironically, controlling media didn't do anything for the Iraq war because the Iraq war was a disaster. <laughs> Even though there were no pictures of American dead published, there were no pictures of American wounded published, 
Even though the military are able to control even the comments of soldiers in Iraq, they still was a mess. And I think that pretty much proves that it wasn't the media, that media access didn't, didn't harm the Iraqi effort. There was no media access, and there was still a disastrous uh, period, disastrous conflict. So you um, were in China, and now you um, have you heard anything about Vietnam War in public opinion or with your student, or any sort of uh, mention about Vietnam War? My students, 19, 20, 21 year old, knew nothing about the Vietnam War. Ho Chi Minh was a vague figure in history. Now I was teaching students that came right out of high school. And the high schools in, in, in China are, are organized to produce the kind of students who the government can use in its infrastructure. Scientists, uh, engineers, doctors, and uh, journalists, in the sense of being propagandists. And their education limits historical, you know, uh, in information from of the world outside China. It restricts information from actions within China, so the early Communist Party actions. What it doesn't restrict are, say, actions that, that are still propagandized by the government, such as the Japanese invasion. But generally, the education is limited to preparing students to you know, have productive lives that that co uh, uh, coordinated into the government structure, meaning that they didn't know anything about Vietnam or a lot of other places. We those stories were not covered from Vietnam because no reporter ever saw a recognizable Chinese. However, from Washington, there was a lot of information put out by the gov U.S. government about Chinese involvement. So routinely, uh, columnists and others would talk about China in Vietnam. It wasn't any secret. And of course, Russia and China. But as the Chinese and Russian split developed in the 60s, there was a lot of talk about, well, what is really happening to the aid? Because Russian aid was coming through, uh, a lot of it through China. Then they realized that it was starting to go in ships to uh, directly to Cambodia. But this was an issue, but we didn't see it in Vietnam. There was no way that we could put any finger on it, but others in the media were covering it, others in our organization. Now, in terms of the my own students, I, whenever I had an occasion, I mean, at least during each semester, I would talk about Chinese relations with Vietnam, you know, post-Vietnam War. Now, I talked about the Vietnam War a lot to my students because I'd been in Vietnam. I had a lot of pictures and video. They were very interested in hearing how reporters function in action. Nick Ut came to visit at one point, the great Nick Ut, to talk about his own, you know, his own career. He was very popular. And, but I would, and, and, but I would base my conversations about uh, China on my own trip that I mentioned earlier to the border areas with the UN Secretary General, Kurt Waldheim. And I had pictures taken of that. And that would, then I'd talk about how China did invade and the reasons that the Chinese gave for the invasion. Because the students were pretty innocent about government actions. I mean, Chinese government aggressiveness in Tibet, uh, they weren't, the information they got was, you know, pretty much supported what the government was doing. But I talked about how 
Deng Xiaoping, who was then the Chinese leader, ordered uh, an invasion of Vietnam to punish Vietnam for their own invasion of Cambodia earlier and how the consequences of that action, many thousands of Chinese were killed. But it's, it was an example of how, you know, national interests collide even among so-called allies. Now, why did China invade Vietnam at that time? Well, in retrospect, it's clear that China was concerned about Russian influence on the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese government, Russian influence. The Chinese had supported Pol Pot in Cambodia. And the ouster of Pol Pot by Vietnamese forces uh, after the, the American war convinced Chinese that Russians were gaining an influence in Cambodia and would gain it in, in Laos and would be threatening to China. Because don't forget at that point, there was still much animosity between the Russians and Chinese that had fought battles on the Usuri River border. That persuaded Deng Xiaoping apparently to invade Vietnam. So I talked about it in terms of the you know, sort of geopolitics of China. Uh, and the students sort of were interested, I think. <laughs> but it's hard. It, it, it is hard. They were young people. It, it, it is very tough to, to, uh, for them to digest such kind of information and to sort of use it in their thinking because you know, they, they, it's a very controlled society. What they most interest about? I mean, student, young student in China, who are learning journalism right now. What they most interest? Uh, most of them want to come to America. To tell you the truth, they they are interested. Well, frankly, they're interested in achieving rapid success. They're convinced that that the government owes them. The, after their education, the government owes them a house, a car, and a good job. And this is something that is a problem for the Chinese government because they've talked so much about the success of their economic programs that the students they're producing by the millions uh, expect to move into society to have all the privileges that others they read about can have. Also, the students are all directly influenced by American culture. When I say they all want to come to America, it doesn't mean to say they want to immigrate to America, but they're interested in America. They like looking at, you know, the internet, they can look at American, you know, young people's television programming for a while, Gossip Girl was a big deal, Sex and the City, these American <clears throat> television programs they can download. And they do understand that the democratic system is very different from the Chinese system. You know, the kind of easy freedoms that are available in the United States. On the other hand, these students are very family oriented and that they see opportunities available. Every, I think all of our students have got employed so have been there. I mean, I don't think there's any unemployment that I know amongst our former students. Now, maybe they're not the jobs they would like, but they seem at this point to feel their futures more likely lie in China than elsewhere. But on the other hand, they'd like to come and, and visit the US and, and, and see the kind of open life that we have here as, a, as it is in elsewhere in the developed world. Thank you, sir. Now, in your mind, thinking about Vietnam War, what is that in your mind? You know, of course, you know, many things, but what is the most in your mind? <laughs> well, that's that. <laughs> I think you have to narrow it down a little. No, I think because in my, you know, in my mind, I, I, I the mean, most, it, it, the most, the most you're thinking of Vietnam War when you look back. What is the most that you thinking of or about? Well, Vietnam was the 
most important, Vietnam was the most important news story that I covered. And uh, when I think about it, though, I, I, I think about the those that I knew in Vietnam, soldiers, uh, reporters who were killed or terribly injured. I talk about my, I think about my own life there, how I met my wife and uh, my children were born there, interacting with her family and their friends. And I think about the, what basically was the waste of so many lives uh, in a conflict that ended the way it did. You know, millions died. And it's a, it, it's, it's a sobering memory. Now, Horst Fass made a fascinating comment years ago when we were at a farewell party. And we both left Vietnam at the same time. Now, we kept returning, but our first official leaving. And we had a group of colleagues. And uh, someone said, well, we're going to get together a lot after the war and talk about the good old days. And Horst said, there were no good old days here. No good old days. And he was right, because his friends, mine, so many others were killed, so many vast suffering that led to a conclusion that, that certainly no one that I knew wanted, that was eventually inevitable. Do you um, satisfy with the war ended, the peace came, everybody wanted that. But after the peace came, more Vietnamese died. No, well, I, I, not a matter of being satisfied or not. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. I mean, journalists, you know, we don't have, we're not elected to office. We don't write legislation. We don't have the military forces. So we just drift with the currents. We drift with the currents. And I hope that we, we, we can observe the reality as best we can when we're assigned to it. I mentioned to you, I went to, did a series on the refugees around the world, including in Malaysia, the Vietnamese boat people. I visited North Vietnam with, with, with Vietnam with, with the Attorney General, with the, with the UN Secretary General. You know, I, we do the best that we can do. But, you know, we, it, it, it's a, journalism's a fast-moving business. I ended up covering over 20 wars in my career. <laughs> so, in, certainly when all of that was happening, as you talk about in Vietnam, I was in, things were happening in the Middle East and in Africa, almost of equal brutality in some cases. So, it, it's, I, in terms of it, journalist, I feel that I did the best I possibly could. I went as far as I could in, in gathering information with soldiers. I had a wife and two children. Yet I was willing to do what my news organization wanted me to do, to tell the story of what was going on. So I don't feel went to the fall of Saigon. I stayed as the communists were coming in, most of the other journalists were leaving. I wanted to see what they were going to do. And the others said, they'll kill you. I said, well, you know, so be it. But I want to, having covered it for so long, I want to watch what's going to be happening in this city. Of course, the communists were smart. They came in cordial, pleasant, and implemented their policies, draconian policies later, out of the public eye. But I had uh, no doubts that it was important that I personally stay, and fortunately had two other A people stay with me. Uh, can you tell me uh, what did you see in Saigon at that time? Uh, I was there and I saw, you know, they uh, uh, gather people and then they have people wearing the red, um, you know, uh, 
แบนแบนแฮนแบนี้แอนโวราโรคันอาอาอซิรีอันนี้มีบอดีดัตเดงไรดิ Yeah but that's another what did I see I saw lots of things <laughs> <laughs> Too many things Can you Can you yeah, But the main thing I remember was that first of all there was no resistance when the communist tanks rolled through the city A little few shots fired and that the Saigon people were not supportive they just watched the communist troops arrive the communist troops didn't welcome us but they didn't interfere with us as we moved around taking pictures take any picture we wanted get a climb on a tank their instructions were clearly get along with the media get along with the local people what i thought was very interesting was that the first week The Viet Cong, distinguished by their clothing, like the, occupied the old, uh, the old, uh, you know, uh, city hall or not, not the city hall, the opera house, that had been used as an assembly by the South Vietnamese government. They occupied it. They had guards around it, and they would start issuing travel. Permissions to anyone, any journalists who wanted to go anywhere. So I'd go and say, I want to go to, to Mito. Okay, here's a pass. After one week, they disappeared. Suddenly, there were North Vietnamese soldiers, and this was the beginning of the absorption of the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front, that had been for 20 years had been saying it represented. South Vietnamese people. This was the first indication that it was being absorbed into the Communist Party and into the government, and would be out of existence sooner than later. But it was very obvious when we saw it. Of course, we wrote about all those things. Some of it we could send out, but other stories we published after we left. Uh, you stayed there until what day? One month. How long you stayed there after the war over? Yeah, about. 10 or 12 days for me and others. Then the rest up to 25 days, <coughs> not long. And then you were asked to leave, or we were told to leave. Yeah, they just said you'll get on this plane, and then they let a few others stay. And then they said they then they put everyone out, and that was it. After you came out, any other uh, be able to stay there to report any. No, when we all left, there was no one, other than Pham Su and An for Time Magazine. <laughs> He stayed. <laughs> He stayed. Naturally, <laughs> we now know. Yes. So. Okay. Thank you so very much. I think that's that's enough. That's, that's, I, I did my best, Nancy. Wonderful.